Okay. All right. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about some work I completed during my PhD on the uh, birth and death dynamics of microorganisms in environments, closed systems with zero exogenous resources over an extended period of time. Um, just briefly before getting into it, uh, just to mention the work I've been doing here at ICTP with Jacopo, it's been primarily focused on community dynamics, though we are work, starting to do some physiology type work. Uh, first project that's out as a preprint recently is this work, collaborative effort with uh, Alvaro Sanchez on basically uh, determining the extent that macroecological laws you get in nature can be reproduced in single carbon source communities, uh, trying to determine the extent that experimental perturbations make quantitative changes to those laws, and the extent that you can predict back those changes using a stochastic logistic model of growth. And on the right here uh, is work to demonstrating how there's this similarity in the macroecology of microbial communities under, across phylogenetic and taxonomic scales, and that's uh, out recently in eLife. Okay, so the framework for sort of this work I've had from, from uh, Jay Lennon's lab is this starting off by saying that I think many here would agree that microorganisms uh, could constitute one of the most successful forms of life on the planet. They've seemingly colonized uh, every possible niche. Uh, diverse environments that are really stressful, ranging from deep sea sediment with cold temperatures and crushing pressure to uh, extreme deserts where they have to survive uh, periods of of uh, very, very uh, rare rainfall to even pristine looking environments such as glacial uh, lakes where there are actually very low nutrient concentrations, as well as the built environment such as um, hospitals where microbes have to be able to survive outside of the host and persist for extended periods of time until the opportunity for infection presents itself again. And they accomplish these uh, sur these tasks of surviving through a variety of mechanisms. This top row here, pictures of uh, bacillus and its famous endospore formation. Uh, bottom left, micrococcus, one, one of the well-known uh, bugs capable of uh, entering extended periods of low metabolic activity and cyanobacterium forming cell wall structures to survive desiccation. And so, despite all these differences in environment and diversity of structure, I would argue, there is this similar demographic regime going on where the microorganisms are outside of what we might want to call a stationary phase of growth and going under either this uh, exponential type decline, this death rate, and then this extended period of stagnation, often called long-term stationary phase. And so we, Jay and I were really doing a lot of work and experimental work um, in Indiana, focusing on these two demographic regimes. And primarily we started out thinking about dormancy and basically how dormancy influences this decline, this death rate. And uh, under this, the sort of null expectation is that you have this constant net rate of growth, and growth defined here is just the difference between births and deaths. And so assuming in this death rate that you've got many more uh, deaths than births, you can basically say that the change in population size you observe is reflective of the death rate, and from that, if you can parameterize that, you can get mean time to extinction, mean time to death of individual cells, and so on, basically from a model of exponential decay. And so we were working with this experiment where it's fairly simple design. It's it was pretty labor intensive and I argue f fairly ambitious, but the design is basically uh, you grow up your bug in a rich media, get a really high cellular density. You pellet and rinse it in some buffer. Uh, we did it in triplicate. You do it three times and then you resuspend and buffer without resources, right? And so you have a high density of cells in a closed system effectively uh, where there are no exogenous resources going in. And these were all with heterotrophic bacteria. And so the core design is to just have 21 different phylogenetically diverse taxa. We have four different phyla. These are all soil isolated taxa from uh, Jay's time at uh, Kellogg Biological Station in Michigan. And we maintain these in the buffer for 1,000 days, plating uh, roughly every seven days with about four to six replicates per uh, taxon. Uh, and so our null expectation from this is that we think, go ahead and heading in this thinking, all right, we do this, we're going to get first order decay rates, we're going to get some estimation on the death rate, we can look at metabolic activity of cells, say something about uh, dormancy. But what happened really was that we only had one taxon that went extinct and had this consistent uh, linear decay, and so we're looking at time on a linear axis, 
in a population size on a logarithmic transformed axis. And so only one species here, Micrococcus, had this constant rate of decline with time on a log linear plot. Everything else had this shape where it, had, it sort of bends out and flattens and plateaus and remains so more or less over 1,000 days. Slight decay, but you know, uh, everything seems to flatten out with the extreme case for clear reasons being uh, our strain of bacillus that we use, which is basically flat. However, uh, I don't have this, I'm not gonna talk about this too much, but we also repeated this bacillus line with a knockout that cannot form spores and did the first 100 days, and we basically get back the, very, very qualitatively consistent pattern, but just the intercept is basically going down an order of magnitude or two. And so this didn't really map up with our idea of dormancy and a, and a bunch of other experiments I did with some metabolomic sampling, um, my, um, some microscopy, staining for dead cells and so on. So it didn't really paint the picture that dormancy is driving this. It's contributing probably, we'd argue, because metabolic activity has to decrease to some extent. but we really ended up with this model of recycling going on. And, and so we started out with a dormancy-driven hypothesis and then we're moving towards how the dynamics within these semi-closed systems are basically driven by recycling. And so system, you can have a system of equations basically where you have your uh, living cells, your dead cells, and then your dead cells going into some pool of resources that they can get consumed by some consumption in order to form new cells, but also primarily, we would argue, to meet the maintenance demands to maintain cellular activity. Uh, okay. So this maps up pretty well qualitatively. Um, in blue here, or purple, is uh, a strain of Yersinia. Uh, and so we do see that because there's a higher initial standing population size, you do end up with this uh, you know, more elbow type decay on a log linear plot versus micrococcus, which just happened to have a initial population size about two or three orders of magnitude lower, had this uh, more linear decay. And that maps up with qualitatively what we get from modeling efforts where basically uh, one of the big control parameters to determine whether or not recycling can drive the long-term dynamics of your system is this population size you start out with. And so there's a and so you can do the model with or without um, an extra term to describe how you know, they're not perfectly efficient in consuming resources and so that there's some loss, some thermodynamic loss, but you end up with this uh, more steady state where the stationary size is greater than equal to zero uh, and then you basically get st a stationary state equal to zero, or equal to zero uh, when your initial population size is too low. Which, I mean, how, how do the cells know with how many they are in the situation? Every cell needs the same amount to survive, no? Well, they don't know. It's the flux of initial dead cells that's determined by the initial uh, number of dead cells. Yeah, but they're also, if you have 10 times as many cells, then the flux of dead cells is 10 times as big, but yeah. is also taken up 10 times as much by 10 times as many survivors, no? I mean, the position of the stationary size is primarily determined by um, these two terms, the maintenance and the, the birth rate. And so, so what is capital R in these equations? Capital R is the concentration of some resource that's excreted by the dead cells. That the, so this is not a, we have not identified the mechanism as in the singular limiting resource in, this, in these experiments, but capital R is just a, as some resource that is excreted by dead cells that then gets consumed to meet energetic demands. Yep. So uh, there is no perpetuum mobile, right? Pardon? And there, you have to provide some energy to get, keep it cycling. Right? Uh, where does right. the energy come from? Uh, well, their energy here is the uh, initial concentration of dead cells, or initial number of living cells that you put in to the experiment. And so this is not, you can add terms to this model and, and we have where you make it so it is not this ideal scenario where you have some decay in, in terms of, you know, due to inefficiencies. But you still get back qualitatively the same pattern uh, here, right? Where the ability to have this deviation from a strict linear decay uh, is determined uh, by the death rate, uh, your initial population size, and this uh, consumption term B, birth rate. 
class with Belgian interest and just close off and yeah. give a certain capital number A. Yeah. That some number is going to survive. But if I now insert a membrane such that half of them are now to talk and half of them are to bottom, you're going to get a different number in the bottom. That seems to be what you're saying. The number, I think it's more reflective of the rate of decline than the number. So you're arguing that you, or that you have an experiment in mind where you just have a porous membrane and you kill half and there's some secretion going. No, no, non-porous. Non-porous. It's the same total number. It's just now two, two boxes with each having half of the cells in them. Yeah, the long-term dynamics of the system seem to depend on the initial population size. If the other demographic parameters are a constant. I mean, I understand that, that this perhaps might be a bit more, this result here with the micrococcus might be a bit more convincing if there was a single strain and then you manipulated demographic parameters, which is work I'm looking to do in the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But basically, uh, if you quantify the death rates, then and, and, and you can, the, the main determinant, the, the main uh, parameter is basically this compound parameter where the population size times the death rate, the per capita death rate, determines whether or not you can reach this, you can have this deviation from long linear decay. So even if you have this recycling and you have still some decay, then you would expect something that's bilinear in log scale. You have some initial death rate yeah. and then they start recycling and then they have another uh, exponential death rate. So then you well, should you, be able to see that. No. You could. Maybe it goes after day 1,000, but we haven't seen it in any of our 20 species that are taxa that are not micrococcus. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, just to follow up on this question, I it all... It also seems, yeah, it seems to me like you could just split the flask into two and you get a different result, but yeah, it was just, I'm trying to understand. So would another way to think about this, like what, could you do an experiment where you spike it with extra micrococcus? And so you predict if you spike with ec extra micrococcus, the shape of the curve changes? You could do that. I mean, I think they kind of did that in this uh, paper I'm going to show later for some future directions where they did it, but they did it in this uh, death phase where they added in dead cells into a decaying population, got a shift in the death rate. And you can interpret the death rate as the balance between uh, resource output to the cellular death and maintenance needs of the cell. Yeah. And, but I, we did not do that for here. Mostly, uh, I think mostly we were in, in terms of thinking of just documenting this pattern and then getting enough biomass at the end of the experiment so we could do sequencing without some initial added cellular material, yeah, sure. potentially complicating that, those analyses. You're already doing it in triplicate and your hands are busy. And <laughs> yeah. yeah, but this, yeah, it's just an idea. It's a good idea, though. Yeah. So, do you want? Um, yeah, on E. coli, there is this uh, bunch of literature on this long-term stationary phase with yep. sort of like gross advantage stationary phase and so on that shows that if you let them long enough, they will sort of have some mutant that are able to harvest like better the nutrients from dead cells and so on. That, that sort of drives those kind of, um, so it's like not dependent on the density of cells at the start, but rather that like you sort of start selecting some mutation that are helping cells to survive better. So, yeah. so we're going to get into that. We don't think that this is driven by mutation at all. We think this is a general demographic response to having this flux of dead resources. And we did have done our own, we don't use the term gas as much because we're not doing E. coli and we didn't do that like phenotype characterization as much, but we have done these long-term stationary phase evolution experiments. And I'm gonna get into briefly at the end um, what the, the designs of those experiments and how they don't make it quite ideal to determine the extent that recycling can contribute towards longevity or how recycling could be a trait that can contribute towards adaptation. Because um, I've done my own long-term stationary phase experiments that are out and uh, there's differences between this setup and that. 
We could, uh, well, so these flasks are, I mean, we're using 50 milliliter Falcon tubes. Um, they are effectively stationary. We shake them up before we uh, sample, but these are th standing upright in the dark, no light exposure, um, and effectively anaerobic in the sense of they get, you know, there's a little head space. We sample very little. We took no more than, I think, a, a milliliter or, or two or three out of the 50 over the course of 1,000 days. We were doing very careful not to turn this in, from an anaerobic, effectively closed system into something where every so many days, half the volume gets filled with air again. Uh, yeah. But I mean, we have this taxi here. I'm not quite familiar on the motility. We have motility assay bulk data from plates and, and prior work Jay's done on, on soil. Um, and, but basically, I would, I would imagine how, I mean, motility doesn't explain the strict linear decline of only Micrococcus. Right. I mean, well, for col right. Well, for colony counting, I mean, our basic protocol was to only use uh, colony counts where the what is it the C total CFUs of a plate were in the range of twenty to a hundred and something. We we were careful to you know get get start counting when they uh, start counting after I think what was it two or three days because the growth slowed down. But also we manually checked. All the counting was done manually and checking whether or not uh, there was this overlapping, you know, circles or rings of growth was something that we monitored and uh, we did not, we don't, I don't think that those are influencing these numbers. Well, the thing with, I mean, yeah, well, something with the QPCR, we didn't want to do this because there is, this is not like a classic evolution experiment where things are growing every day and there's new biomass coming in. We were making sure to be careful not to take all the biomass, you know, before we had this, before we could actually qualitatively determine the patterns of, of uh, in, these, in these systems. So we didn't want to do, you know, we didn't want to get a, a tenth of the biomass within the first 10 days or something like that to do more, you know, to get DNA extraction. I mean, by the end of the experiment, there were only nine taxes that had sufficient DNA, even after um, all the, the tricks we did to get as much DNA out of it for pooled population sequencing. Yeah. Okay. Um, right, so we have, uh, wor working with Jay, we have this sort of more phenomenological type system of equations to describe the qualitative behaviors of the experiment. Um, just in order to get survival time, we ended up just uh, going into the statistical world and treating this as a survival analysis type pattern, mostly because, I mean, if you take the differences in total population size with respect to time, it doesn't really ever increase with time, which allows you to treat it as a survival type function where the, it basically has to go to zero. And we ended up choosing after a few distributions, basically the Weibull distribution, um, and mostly because of its flexibility, where there is this shape parameter k, and if k goes to one, then it reduces to an exponential uh, form. And so the intuition here is that k getting much, much, much smaller than one uh, can be viewed as a, an approximation of the increase in the net rate of growth over the course of the experiment. And so if you do this, um, statistical analysis and all the replicates and, and compare the degree that growth rate changed from the shape parameter of the survival distribution uh, to the initial flux of dead cells, which we're defining as the initial death rate of the population times the population size, initial population size, that nt should be n0. Um, then we see this, what, see, we see, we see what we expect, a greater initial flux, a greater deviation from exponential decay, 
And so Micrococcus is up here in the top left, basically, where it's exponential. And then Yersinia is somewhere over in the middle. Generally, the distribution tend to hold well. We're probably stretching it a bit by putting Bacillus because it's such an extreme, sharp, elbow-type plot. But for the bulk of, of attacks, it tends to follow this uh, relationship we'd expect of the parameters. Uh, there we go. And so once you have these parameterized, then just to get some proxies, we can look at the average time to extinction, which we define based off the minimum resolution, the minimum number of cells that we can detect given our plating approach. Uh, and then and also to calculate the average time to death of a given cell. The cells is the clear, uh, the clear outlier, and we have the median and the dashed gray lines, so it takes about 10 days here. And so these might be a bit of extreme because a lot of these are predictions, right? We only saw one taxa that actually went extinct. That was Micrococcus. That's the only one where you can actually say this is where it went extinct by looking at the plot. Everything else is extrapolation. But, I, but basically, I think it, we are justified in at least presenting these as cautionary results on the extent that uh, a population can survive in a pretty much closed system uh, under anaerobic conditions. Right, so additional evidence, um, we did some microscopy work. Dead cells do not tend to accumulate over 1,000 days, apply cellular recycling. Uh, cells with a greater increase in growth rate, and here I mean an increase, here I mean the shape parameter, cells that tended to have a greater increase in the net rate of growth with time in the experiment, uh, tended to have lower lag phases when you were to take the ancestor of our um, of our strains and grow them up on the same rich media that we used to, to start this experiment off in the first place, right? And so from that, you get the lag time here in very rich. I think we were, I think the whole thing was done in LB. And then the y-axis is roughly the, can be interpreted as the deviation from exponential decay uh, in our experiments. And so this uh, relationship here does fall out is, is related to um, a, a single model, a kinetic model of microbial growth, which we suggested to, uh, is, reflects the reality that any sort of recycling requires some type of kinetic activity in the cell. But we, I'd, we'd like to get into like, physically why this is happening. We haven't quite yet. So I think the big question on which we determined this was that we'd like to know how the net rate of growth is increasing with respect to time. Fewer births or, or fewer deaths or more births, the two ways to change that uh, net rate. And so, you know, you do this experiment, you're, you get to the end, there is, you can't repeat it, it takes forever. Um, what we ended up doing, we wanted to sequence it anyway because we had this gas question in mind, right? Um, so we, I, I uh, got all the biomass, did basically, all the DNA extraction tricks we had to do something of this scale and extracted uh, DNA from at the end of the experiment. It was very low, but we were able to successfully do pooled population sequencing. And from that, we can get the allele frequency spectrum of derived mutation, or of derived, not derived, we get the allele frequency spectrum of acquired mutations over the course of the experiment. And so, well, uh, the next slide, I think, is going to answer your question, but basically, um, we wanted to get frequencies. We, we did not necessarily want to have only a couple clones to identify potential targets of selection from doing DNDS calculations. We wanted to try to identify the maximum frequency that a mutation has reached in the population. And we didn't want to do 20, 30 clones per replicate population because we've got nine taxa, about four replicates per 36. Do that with 20, you've got like 300 and 400 libraries you have to prep. And here we've got 36. Because we want to get frequencies, so we have to have repeated clones sequence. You couldn't just grow them up in a liquid culture? We did. We can. We, everything at the end of the experiment was, uh, aliquot was taken, grown up, and cryopreserved in, uh, I think, triplicate back in Jay's lab. So the end at the 1,000 days, they're all grown up and cryopreserved. And you sequenced that? No. We, se we took a little bit of that. The sequencing, I got the biomass at the end of the 1,000 days because I wanted the frequencies as they are in the tube and not grow them up and change the frequencies when they're back in the fresh media. 
Um, so, a few lines of evidence in addition to some metabolomic stuff, but basically there is no relationship between the deviation from exponential decay and these coverage-based proxies of birth rate where the slope of the distribution of coverage along the genome should reflect the degree of nested replication going on in bacteria. So there's no relationship. And so that is a, taking these like IREP or these things and saying it's a birth rate is a bit far-fetched, but I think this is some qualitative evidence that birth rates do not substantially contribute towards this uh, deviation from exponential decay we observed. Um, however, we did get back from this approximately 100 to 1,000 mutations per replicate population. Um, this was all pooled population sequencing analyzed with using uh, the software BreSeq uh, to call uh, allele frequencies. Max frequencies reached 0.3 to 0.6, and so I think that's an important uh, qualitative result is that there were no substitutions in this experiment over 1,000 days. There were no fixation events going on within the population at all. And that contrasts with a lot of gas type analyses, but I think that's basically because there is a slower turnover rate of the population. The, the generation time is much, much longer in our system than a typical GASP and type setup, which we also did some GASP stuff, which I'll show later. Um, so this is all some lines of evidence, quantitative evidence that suggests qualitatively that there's very low numbers of generations that went on in the experiment. And so the change in growth rate was primarily driven by a decrease in death rate. Um, so if we take a look at these actual mutations, we can see that overwhelmingly, you know, the, the proportion of non-synonymous to synonymous is, tends to be lower than one. It's significant for five of the seven taxa that we had enough mutations uh, to do this uh, analysis. And so there were, but if we look at the, uh, the uh, genes that, were, that acquired more non-synonymous mutations than expected by chance under a Poisson null model, uh, we see that there are three pathways that were enriched and two of the seven taxa that we were the, the analysis on. So there's not extensive evidence of adaptation, but what we do see here tends to make sense, I'd argue. Uh, lysine biosynthesis, pyrimidine biosynthesis, and amino acid transport were all enriched for non-synonymous mutations, and importantly, none of them uh, were stop mutations. So this suggests the modification, potentially, of an existing function for the environment rather than its loss to meet energetic demands for the, for, for the uh, energetic budget of the cell. So how many cellular divisions? That's, I think, very difficult to get quantitative numbers on in systems that are definitely out of uh, balanced growth. Um, but we were making these, we were using our uh, pool population data to try and make some rough arguments on the extent that a birth, that the extent that birth needs to occur to a drive a de novo mutation up to a given frequency with a known population size. And so um, these are treated as, I think, roughly heuristics, but just trying to get some order of magnitude type intuition on what births had to happen. And so we have our final frequency at day uh, of a mutant at, at day 1,000. Multiply it by the population size at day 1,000. You get the size of the, of the mutant lineage at day 1,000. Now, just assuming that this is happening as a branching process, and we did a bunch of, a few other branching processes where you assume some selection coefficient, but just to take in the neutral case, just to have a baseline and make as um, few assumptions about selection as possible, uh, you can assume that the number of generations that happen over the 1,000 days is the log to base two of the size of the mutant lineage, and then just do a, say it's just a, uh, standard neutral type branching process and do this heuristic type calculation on the minimum number of birth events necessary to get you to a lineage of that size. And if we compare that to the change in population size over 1,000 days, we see that the number of birth events are about 10 to the 4 to 10 to the 6 for different taxa that had enough mutations to do this for. Um, and the contribution, though, to the final population size is relative to the final population size is comparatively low, it's about 0.1. We think that this result is qualitatively consistent with the interpretation that the dynamics in the system are primarily driven by a decrease in death rate rather than an increase in birth rate. And so these are, again, rough and making a few assumptions, but sort of saying, what can we do at the end of a three-year-long experiment, not counting planning and the extra uh, effort that went into it to try and get some intuition about what's going on in this very, very far from steady state uh, system. 
So to recap, um, basically we think growth rate increases, net rate of growth increases over time under energy limitation consistently across taxa if you, dependent on the initial conditions. This is a closed system, so that's a requirement. We think that the dynamics are driven by necromass recycling. This increase in the net rate of growth is primarily driven by a decrease in the death rate, but birth still occurs. Quantifying the extent that it occurs, I think, is a like getting the exact number is in, remains an open question. It's low, but it's but evolution still happened in this system, and the average time to death varied about a thousand fold across taxa. And again, uh, some of that's uh, well, this is time to death, but it, it also had similar variation for time to extinction. But that's extrapolation a little bit because we only saw extinction in one taxon. Um, what bacillus is an obviously clear outlier. Um, so, talking with Yakpo Ben and being here. Uh, about uh, uh, has been really good for understanding what how physiology could play a role. Oh yeah, did you? Five minutes. Okay. Um, so I got this experiment basically wrapped up like three weeks before lockdown. We wrote it and published it during lockdown. I didn't get to talk about it too much uh, because of lockdown. So um, being here, we've been thinking about like what could be going on physio physiologically and starting to do a little modeling of death and recycling as a stochastic process, but. Also thinking about how does it impact the evolution of the bug. And so this is the gas type stuff for the long-term stationary phase experiments. Some people use either or both terms, but basically I think there's similarity in design that you can, for, for this question, group them together. So there's many out there done long-term, uh, you know, stationary phase or long-term energy limited evolution experiments, and the design remains qualitatively similar, I think, despite all the, all the groups doing it, myself included. And that's basically, you have a bug, you grow it up, uh, you get some replicates, and you leave it in the flask for some number of days. And sometimes you might transfer it to the, to the flask again with fresh media and then leave it for the same number of days and keep it going. Uh, or other times you might just leave it forever and just see where it goes. But the point is that these are bugs in spent media, and so they basically go through that whole birth, stationary phase, death phase, long-term stationary phase dynamic, and I think that that's difficult for interpreting or understanding something like to what extent this recycling process can contribute because not only do you have major changes in population size, you also have changing environment because these are often done in complex media where you have massive excretion of cellular material that changes the pH, different resources get consumed at different uh, phases of growth. Um, and my goal, I think, for using the uh, physics training I've uh, been getting here at ICTP is try to design uh, experiments that are more apt towards at quantifying the degree that recycling can contribute towards birth rates. And so the idea is to just set up the experiment to push the population and balance growth instead of doing these gas type things where you leave them in the, in the, the bugs in the flask forever. Um, so basically, long term evolution experiment I'd like to do with necromass as the sole resource, and that proof of principle has been done with uh, this uh, Sebastian Schink paper, I think, where they, you know, they had one you know, fraction of like 0.01 living cells to 0.99 dead cells. That ratio would have to be, you know, really, that, that difference would have to be cranked up, I think, in order to get substantial burp events to do the type of analyses I'd want to do. But the principle that you can put a low a number of living cells a lot of dead cells and get actual growth that might be consistent with our understanding of balanced growth, I think, is there is evidence for that. Um, and so some hypotheses about what might be happening if you were, if I could, in the future, uh, get this type of experiment going is that uh, recycling, I would argue, requires a ramping up of catabolism to bring extracellular material into the cell. Uh, I would argue or predict that mutations that improve catabolism would also result in an uh, indirect increase in allocation to ribosomes, and so uh, you reduce your catabolic requirements through adaptation to try and, and when you, uh, and that uh, results in an increase in fitness. And so these are all predictions, but uh, some directions I'd like to take this avenue of research. Um, and so there might be a little bit of evidence out there. There's really only one proteomic study on these gas lines from a while back. And that wasn't like full quantitative proteomics. It was this 2DE uh, plate type uh, differential expression type experiment. But basically, it was an experiment where you, it was gas, but you just get the E. coli in a flask for 10 years. And then it was plated. And then that was used for proteomic analysis. And 
If you look at differentially expressed genes relative to the ancestor, there's a 29 increase of the metabolic sector within uh, the evolved strain, and most of that increase is in the catabolic sector, and about 6% increase in the protein synthesis sector. But again, that's one experiment and not with the most extensive possible proteomic uh, analysis or experiment. And so you only briefly uh, saw some stuff here from ICTP, but uh, thanking everyone here, uh, uh, PhD advisor Jay, um, the people from the London Lab that contributed to this study that are now, and where they are now, and uh, Jacopo and Alvaro for the brief bit of ICTP stuff you saw at the beginning. Questions? Um, so, you know, in order to maintain a population over a long time, um, there must be some source of free energy right? mm -hmm. because uh, living uh, life. So, could you explain where, what's the source of free energy that is continuously coming in to maintain the population? I d well, it's from the dead cells, but I don't know the cellular constituent that is contributing. That's a question I've had written some proposals in the past to try and get answers to, but um, we don't know that. I think also part of the equation there is that the maintenance rate is decreasing with time. We don't have, we didn't get quantitative cell size estimates, but I would believe that cell size is decreasing. The total uh, maintenance requirement per cell is decreasing as a function of time, but I don't, I would, but I don't know the order of magnitude that it's decreasing. So, um, you know, I mean, the population seems to be at a steady state, right? I mean, that's, uh, the population is steady state. Yeah. Is the biomass shrinking? Well, we couldn't measure that because if we got enough biomass, we wouldn't be able to keep the experiment going. So I guess the way to do that would be you start up a bunch of replicate flasks and then you say these are going to be sacrificed at day 10, day 50, day so on, and then you can, uh, well, the total biomass of the system can't change because it's closed, except for sampling. But the biomass of living cells, I yes. guess you could. The biomass of living cells. Yeah, I guess you could do, um, you, could, you could have that system where you like harvest them or sacrifice certain cultures at certain times and then do uh, maybe some like cell size filter type to only get the biomass that's likely to be living cells and then get an estimate from there. But I, we can't, we didn't do that. Uh, but one would expect, you know, I mean, just uh, 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 in order to maintain a non-equilibrium system, yeah. you need some flux of energy from somewhere. Yeah. So the biomass, uh, if the number of cells is remaining constant, then the biomass must be shrinking, right? Um, no, I think, it, I mean, okay, yeah, so you're thinking of biomass. I'm thinking of per cell volume or per cell mass. But yeah, I think that that is correct, yeah. So, I mean, if you, uh, how long would you be able to sustain life uh, in this? Do you, do you have I don't know. I mean, we have, we stopped the experiment, um, and we have predictions on extinction times, but those are extrapolations. So we don't have empirical evidence of how long this could happen. I mean, maybe Jay has like one or two, he might have one or two Falcon tubes that are just, let this system in a drawer somewhere in Indiana sitting there. I think we might have done that, but uh, they're not being monitored. They're just left, and I imagine something may happen with them eventually. Yeah, I think the DNA sequencing data is potentially very interesting. Can you maybe say a little bit more? So how many different populations did you, did you sequence at the end? So, right here are all the nine nine taxa yes. that had well taxa nine taxa that had enough DNA and enough replicates to do some statistical analyses, and then that got whittled down to seven for specific analyses where I was looking at the targets of mutation as well as the number. Um, so there's nine here, and I think there should be. It's uh, it, this is all all the data is on Zenodo and GitHub, but the the frequencies. Here are for the different histograms. Or and this is the PNAS paper. Yeah, yeah. So the um, there should be three to five replicate populations within each histogram. So these are all overlapping histograms, one for each replicate within a given taxon. 
And this is the frequency distribution of the SNPs that you see? Yes. Yeah. And I think this might also have, we didn't get too many insertions and deletions, but I, might, I think I might have just pulled everything together here. All right. Very interesting. Okay. Yeah. Hi. Um, in this paper that you showed from Shink in 2019, right, they express the death rate, like they explain the exponential uh, death kinetics by the balance between this maintenance rate and yeah. how much nutrients you're able to scavenge per uh, dead cells. Yeah. And they have ways to measure that. Yeah. Do you think there would be a way to sort of um, use your uh, frozen stocks to sort of like submit them to the same kind of experiments? Yeah, you could do that same death rate. And so you would be able to also measure very important phenotypic traits such as like the maintenance rate and um, yeah. uh, like the amount of nutrient they are able to scavenge and see sort of whether both are changing, whether the maintenance rate is just dropping very low. Well, so I think that, I mean, we thought about what analyses to do at the end of the experiment, and so we didn't get to do them because there was the, uh, the pandemic. But I mean, I think one of the key things that sort of limits the ability to just go in, plate your uh, your, your stock from the end of the experiment, and then just pick a colony and do an and do an experiment and ask about change in traits, is that there are no fixed mutations. So this is not Lenski's experiment where you're saying there's this many fixed mutations at time. 10,000 generations, 30,000, so on. And, and so you expect you can get some per substitution rate of phenotypic change or trait change or whatever. You, you have to know the identity of the mutations. And so perhaps something, we also have these, uh, I don't think I have slides from this, but we have, and of course this is just another GASP, one of many GASP experiments, but we have in this, uh, uh, this uh, 2021 paper, a you know L, uh, long term stationary phase experiment with six taxa, uh, and that we do see substitutions. They tend to be rare. That was a, a nine hundred day experiment, um, but there are a few substitutions. So you could just go in and, and, and take a colony and know that there is an evolutionary, a genetic change in that colony. And, oh, and also we have that in this genetics paper we did with bacillus with and without the ability to form spores. And so there, there are actually a considerable number of fixation events. Uh, in certain treatments once you knocked out the ability to form spores because that's just a buffer in terms of population genetic dynamics. But we do know that all these guys are dying at a lower rate than the guy that died at the beginning of the experiment. So like, what is your idea when you have this diversity of, of uh, genetic background? Is that like it's a constant sort of resetting of your uh, uh, genomes or is it, are they coexisting like uh, faintly? I mean, like, what's what? Well, we took the, um, at the end of the experiment, we took a little bit of biomass, grew it up in a flask. I don't think the bottlenecking from that was too bad, but then, but there's still the reality of, you know, you have to know what mutations are in which colony if you want to measure a trait and compare it to the ancestor and have that and, and, and say something about the difference in that it's actually due to evolution. It's due to changes in, uh, and a change in uh, mutation frequencies with respect to time. And that would require, I think, getting a colony, growing it up, sequencing the colony, and knowing that it has these mutations. And, and that's an extra step versus something where there are very high turnover in, in cells, and you can have a very short generation time and, and just know that, you know, you, okay, it's, I would think it would be a pretty fair guess for like Lenski, and this is what they had to do for sequencing. They just know there's enough generations going on that you're likely to have some fixations. Uh, and so if you just pick a colony and do your fitness assay, it should represent some evolution, actual evolutionary change and not some change in phenotypic plasticity or some, you know, some, something that's not genetically uh, caused. Which is why I also think that like doing an, ex doing an experiment like this, with just dead cells as the resource and cranking up the, the concentration of dead cells gets you the, not only puts the population in balanced growth, but that changes the total time scale of the experiment so you can get fixations within the uh, time scale of a single PhD and be able to do some evolutionary analyses. How do you mean that? Uh... Well, so like if you, if you just have more and more if you increase the concentration of dead cells and you can do this type of experiment like they did where you know there's about two days 
uh, where the population goes from 10 to the 6th to 10 to the 8th, and you just repeat that, that's only double the time scale of Lenski's experiment to get the same number of generations versus some of like the gas type stuff where we don't even know how many generations went on over the course of the experiment. At least I don't for my gas type stuff. But in those experiments, they specifically stop at 10 days because they don't want to enter this regime where cell cells stop dying exponentially because you start having mutations and so on precisely. Yeah, no, they didn't want to do evolution, so they stopped it. But I'm saying you keep it, you keep the experiment going because you do want evolution. Yes, but like how does this, like adding dead cells is going to change the time scale substantially? I, I, no, you're I not see. adding, so you're, you have this experiment going on, and for, I think their proof of concept is that you can get you know, some, an acceptable, you know, experimental uh, parameter regime to do an evolution experiment where you just transfer every two days, the population stays, uh, I mean, well, even when one day, I think that's when exponential balance growth cuts off. So say you just transfer every one day, you keep the population and balance growth on this resource, and so you can understand the adaptation to this specific resource without the, all the demographic, uh, issues that come with something like growth advantage at stationary phase. Okay, sorry, I get yeah. One more question. Hi, very quickly. Uh, what exactly, or do you know, what is the nutrient that the dead cells are providing to the alive cell? That they excrete something that just break up and provide everything, or? Do you have an idea about that? I don't know from this experiment. I've talked with some researchers that were thinking about recycling, and it's, I don't think it's exactly clear at the moment. I mean, I think that. First, might be separating cellular components by the type of macromolecule and then just comparing death rates on the different macromolecules and try to see what ex which. One explains most of the variation when you have the whole cell dead in the, uh, in the flask. Very, very little question. Yeah. Did you try to use a minimal growth medium, uh, for example, the, uh, uh -huh. just to uh, try not to give too much uh, food to this bacteria? Yeah. No, I, I think that's yeah, a good okay. point. I mean, you could repeat this experiment mm -hmm. with the minimal media in a larger total volume flask to get a similar final density of mm -hmm. cells. And I think that, that, well, we know from like some of this, not this paper, but the other one from around the same time in molecular, yeah, the 2020, 2020 paper, I think, that your birth rate uh, or growth rate uh, on a very on a medium determines your death rate when you get them out of the medium and put them into uh, some resource-free environment. And so I think that yeah, if you have in the minimal medium with lower growth rate, you would decrease the death rate and push the um, that parameter away. And so I, I don't have this plot, but actually you can take the parameters of the system of equations here and get a phase diagram on the parameter regimes where extinction should and shouldn't happen. And so in order to do that, you need to be able to manipulate population size, which is easy, but you also need to manipulate death rate. And so that experiment provides a easy way to get about an order of magnitude variation in death rate uh, just by manipulating growth rate. And so something I, I would like to do is, get, is test extinction times using that more manipulation of parameters for just a single strain. Just to, just to enhance the necromass in this case. If you have a low, for, for example, it's, it's the same thing for the, for the eukaryotic cells. Right. If you cannot use the high glucose growth media if you have to see some activation of pathways or some genes uh, yeah. for adhesion or whatever. It's the same thing for the bacteria. If you use too much nutrients, uh, the bacteria is like to ha they have the fridge uh, at, 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 their, at their disposal. Yes. So yeah. it's not possible. If you want to erase your necromas just to see if your hypothesis is correct, uh, it's just in my, in my, in my mind, right. it's better to use a minimal medium uh, just to see if the necromas, as you, as you told just now, could be different or not. Just, I don't, I don't remember what kind of growth media did you use for your experiments. I, I think for all these, we grew up in LB, and then I did the growth curves in LB again. 
LB. Okay, it's it's very yeah. very rich medium uh, LB. Yeah. yeah, I mean part of it was Gloria that Bertani we have very rich. Well, part of the limitation is that we've got uh, we wanted to capture phylogenetic diversity, mm -hmm. and so we wanted to get a medium where everything grows on that. But that's fine if you're just going to pick a single bug and do a defined medium and then just concentrate on manipulating parameters instead of trying to sample the parameters space of the phylogeny or something like that. Okay, thank you. It's over. So let's say again.